Well, good morning, and welcome back to week four of the Wex Photo Video Wildlife Photography course. We're here on what is a beautiful morning at RSPB Titwell on the Norfolk coast, and this is a stunning location to come for some bird photography. That is what we're here for today. I'll be taking you behind the scenes of how I shoot images out in the field, giving you some tips and tricks about how I set up, get ready, find my actual subject, and make those images that you want to really take home. But what we're going to do now is start with a little bit of hide work. Great way to get close to subjects and find some different images when you're out in the field. So I'm going to settle in and see what's out in front of me. So when it comes to wildlife photography, hides like this are a pretty normal location that I spend a great amount of time in. They're fantastic for getting you closer to wildlife because they're inbuilt, they're in position for you know, long and extensive periods of time. It means the wildlife gets super comfortable with their position. Areas like this on nature reserves can provide you with stunning close-up views, but they are the sort of location that you are gonna to have to spend a great amount of time in. You're not just gonna come into a hide once and just nail those perfect pictures every single time. They're the sort of locations that you want to come back to time and time again to really get some interesting and different pictures. You know, sitting in here in the quiet in the morning, you can have subjects coming really close to the front. But on other days when, you know, the weather's not right and everything isn't correct, they might be right off in the distance. So it can be quite a mixed bag. If you're working with a shorter telephoto, sometimes that can be a little bit restrictive. But you know, if you've got a mid-length telephoto, something 300 mil, 400 mil, these can really make some interesting and different shots. So what I'm gonna do is settle in, have a look out and see what I can find. Right, so I'm just photographing a group of godwits that are flying around and just been disturbed. And this is sort of one of the issues that you can find uh, with hide photography. When birds are flying towards you, up and over you very quickly, you're kind of restricted in the view you had. Obviously, I've got a nice amount of distance that I can look out over, but as soon as they fly high above me, I'm restricted by the height of my hide. One of the things that's really nice about these sort of hides is they've got very large windows. And this can be a bit of a mixed bag. It's great for flight photography and stuff like this that I'm trying to do this morning. But if you're actually tempting birds closer and you want them to come really near, the small windowed hides are often better for that. Of course, you can close these up to give you a bit more restricted view. This is good if you want to really just hide your form a little bit more from the wildlife. But of course, as I'm working with kind of groups of waders here that are flying around, I'm not too worried about that. The kind of unrestricted view is far more useful for my photography. Right see if they're gonna pass over again. Right, so whilst there's a bit of a lull in the action out in front of the hide, it's probably a good chance to talk through the settings. Now, as a photographer, I like to have my camera in manual mode. It's just how I've kind of been taught and had my photography and done it for years. But for many people, aperture priority might also work very well for you. It gives you a bit more flexibility and speed for that changing uh, shutter speed as what stuff is happening out in front of you. Now, to start and kind of base my settings, you know, firstly, I've got to look at the light in front of me. Today, it's really nice and bright, so I can use an ISO of around 400 without any problems whatsoever. My aperture, I've usually got it open as wide as my lens can go. This is the 400 mil, and it's up to 4.5. The reason I want that is not only to let as much light in as possible, but also gives me that shallower depth of field that I quite like within my images. Now, the two of these things, the ISO and the uh, aperture combined, um, is really in the idea of making sure that I've got a shutter speed that's fast enough to freeze any motion that's in front of me. Birds, when they're flying around, they're moving very quickly, so you've really got to have a high shutter speed to absolutely freeze them to get those crystal um, clear images. Some people often talk about the rule of focal length and making sure that your shutter speed is for the right length of your lens. You know, I've got a 400 mil here, so using 400th of a second. And that is correct for really camera shake rather than actual movement in wildlife photography. What I'm considering a lot more is actually the speed of my subject. Those wings are moving so quickly that actually if I was using 400th of a second for some of the smaller birds that's out in front of me, I still would get a little bit of blur within those images. 
Now sometimes blur is what you're after. If you're photographing big groups of birds, for example, it can be really nice to slow your shutter speed down, use um, 1 60th of a second all the way down to even half a second. These can create some really cool images as the birds blur through the frame, give that real sense of motion and movement into your images, something that can be a little bit different. And it's certainly something that's worth exploring if the light isn't as good as it is today. You know, if it's really cloudy and overcast, it's getting dark at the end of the day, well, you know what? Experiment with some slow shutter speeds. You'll be surprised by some of the images you can get, and often for me, they're some of the ones that I really take home as absolute favorites. So certainly something worth trying when you're out in the field. Right, so we talked about exposure and kind of my general settings for that. Of course, it does change depending on lighting conditions and things. Um, but let's talk about um, autofocus now and how I have the camera set up. Now, for me, I use rear button autofocus. That means that the shutter button on my camera doesn't um, initiate the focus. That's because I really want to be choosing the time that my autofocus initiates uh, and especially when you're working in locations where you might have foliage blowing around and things like that, it can distract the autofocus sometimes and so I only want it to be focusing when I'm pressing that rear button. Now in terms of my autofocus settings I'm always in continuous autofocus because I want that camera to be adjusting to every little movement of my subject. You know very rarely are birds still ever in the frame. They're always Going to be moving slightly towards you away from you to the side of you so you need your autofocus to be constantly keeping up with them a lot of the time i'm using single point autofocus just because i like the accuracy of it and i can uh, make sure that i'm really focusing on a certain point sometimes of course i'm going to be usually tracking the eye of a bird that's the best place to focus to really make your images pop but in some cases i am going to want to specifically focus on another area of the frame so having single point works very well for that now the way i actually have the camera set up is I like to utilize as many buttons as I can on my camera. You might find that your camera is different to this, but this is just how I have things set up. Um, on the front, as I said, you know, my AF on button, that's going to give me single point autofocus. That's my general stuff, you know, when it's static. If I press my joystick in, that gives me immediate access to 3D tracking. Fantastic for suddenly if birds erupt up and I want to track them in flight, anything like that as they're coming across, I can immediately get to it. I don't have to press a button, toggle anything, you know, it's just straight on and I can get there. And then on my front FM button, I've actually got a wide area set, um, something I don't use as often, but now that I've got the eye tracking in it, it can be quite handy um, if a bird's in a specific area and it's just moving in and out slightly, I, I will use that too. The final point that I will talk about that might seem irrelevant in today's day and age with all the wonderful autofocus technology we have is that you should go and learn manual focus. There are times as a wildlife photographer when it's starting to get dark, things are dropping off and the camera will struggle. Any camera will struggle. You've got foliage moving in and out and it just is picking everything up and you've got very limited time to get that shot perfect. But understanding manual focus and be able to quickly dial it in it can be super useful in different uh, scenarios to really get an image when it might not have been possible. It's just something that's definitely worth learning and uh, to have in your kind of skill set as a bird photographer. Right, so we've left the hide and we're gonna head up to the beach now and see what else we can find. But when you're walking trails and tracks around nature reserves, you'd be surprised how brilliant these spots can be for your bird photography. A lot of the time I've made some of my best images actually on the tracks and trails at locations rather than in the static hides or kind of obvious viewpoints that they put out for you. It's these areas that are you know, consistent with people walking through that can get the birds really comfortable to your presence here. Waiting along a little area like this can be an ideal spot for just seeing birds popping up into the grass or sitting up in the reeds and things like that to give you those images. Many of the times I'm waiting in these locations, setting my tripod up and just standing there watching for birds to come close. And if you spot things ahead with your binoculars, you know, see a bird sitting in a certain perch, it's likely that it will come back there again. So if you just wait it out and spend the time, you know, thinking it's gonna come back, more often than not, you'll actually get some images.
So we've come down to the beach that is certainly one of my favourite places to photograph. And just looking out across, I can already see different groups of birds up in front of me. Scanning like this is really important to make sure that A, you're heading in the right direction down the beach to find your subject, and B, to kind of learn how you're gonna get in front of them. I know that the tide is coming in at the moment, and that means that you know the birds are gonna be pushed up the beach towards me. So hopefully what I can do is by looking at the beach and seeing where the kind of water channels come up and get myself up on top of them. And as the uh, tide pushes in, hopefully it'll move the birds towards me. and I won't have to do too much crawling. Now this is one of those locations where you really do get out what you put in. I'm gonna have to get myself geared, Gore-Texed up to make sure I can lay down and crawl across all the wet sand to get myself into position. But largely getting low on the sand, stuff like this, is gonna give me a really cool angle and certainly give you a great opportunity for some really nice bird portraits. Right, so as I'm walking along the beach, I'm always looking up ahead of me to see what I can find. At this time of year, especially in the winter, you know, we've got a lot of stuff moving through. Um, birds that are coming back on migration to winter here in the UK. Um, so it's a good time to be down on the beach looking for wildlife. Great spot for wheat ears, wind chats, um, stuff like that. But also, of course, on the actual coastal edge, I'm going to get my sandlings and dunlins. Lots of different subjects that are nice to photograph. Looking out across, I can already see there's a couple of flocks moving in. Some geese over there. The whole group of waders down the end that is probably where we're going to make tracks towards. I'm going to keep on uh, the line of the beach get up ahead of them and hopefully as the waves and sea moves its way in, they'll push the birds right up on top of me for some images. So I've been walking down the beach, just keeping my eyes open and there's some great flocks of waders now that are appearing. So what I'm probably going to do now is uh, that I'm probably 50, 60 meters from some of the birds up in front of me. So I'm going to get myself kitted up put my waterproof trousers and everything like that on. And then I've got kind of two options of how I can get close. Now I know from my research that uh, the tide is coming in, gonna peak up at about 11 o'clock. Uh, that should be pretty good. But by then, of course, the light will be a little bit higher in the sky. It won't be the best for making pictures. Uh, so it probably won't be the, the way that I do it today. Instead, what I think I'm gonna do, start slowly moving my way in closer getting down on the ground and crawling, dropping my silhouette as much as I possibly can to really reduce my impact on my subjects as I'm getting closer. And then with any luck, position myself uh, for some nice images of them moving along, along the coast. The waves are looking really cool, how the wind's buffeting them. I'm hoping that if I get down onto the edge, as the birds move themselves along the tide line, I might even get them coming straight towards me. That would be absolutely ideal. Um, yeah. Now, one thing I am going to do is leave most of my gear here. I'm in the beach, I'm miles away from anyone, um, so it should be okay. Just gonna take the long lens, 400 mil on the Z9, uh, and I'm gonna use that out in front of me. Now, of course, if I was waiting in position, I'd set the tripod up nice and low to the ground to give my static shot. But as I'm gonna be you know, moving, uh, crawling across the ground, I'm gonna work handheld and in the light that we've got today should be absolutely fine for that, no problem at all. So right, I'm gonna get my Gore-Tex on, get the camera cover on, because obviously on the wet beach and everything like that, it's really good to protect your equipment as much as you can from the salt spray and the sand and everything. And then uh, I'll start making my way. And with any luck, get close to a few beautiful waders. Right, so I'm pretty geared up and ready to go. There's some sandlings just coming across in front of me that's really nice. Um, one of the last things I do, obviously, if I'm not taking the kit bag, is make sure you've got a spare battery and a memory card in your pocket. You know, you can get carried away down there, make hundreds and hundreds of images, and then go, oh no, I haven't got a card. You've got to crawl the whole way back to your bag. It can be a right nightmare, so it's just so much easier to make sure you've got one in your pocket before you go. It means you can have a really nice time doing some bird photography. Oh, look at these. Sandlings are one of my absolute favorite birds and there's a lovely pair of them there. So I think what I'm gonna do is cross here, get onto the edge where the, uh, where the sea 
and the uh, tide line is and uh, start making some pictures. The camera's ready to go in the um, all ready and you know waterproofed up. Oh, the sea looks amazing with it blowing over like that. Of course, got to be careful of the spray and the wind, but um, this should keep everything protected. Make sure my camera is coming out all right. Bag's fine. Zip that back up. Make sure nothing gets in there. And uh, let's go find some birds. Right, so I'm just watching a lovely couple of sandlings who are making their way down the edge here. I've got my position just ahead of them. I'm nice and low on the ground. And the wind is blowing them across my side. I'm just using my um, 3D tracking here to keep up with them as they go. And moving, oh, that's really low. The wind is just buffeting them about. That is fantastic, look, beautiful little birds. So strong in the wind, it's absolutely amazing that these guys fly all the way back from the Arctic to come here on our shores. This is what oh, British bird photography is all about. That is beautiful. That is a lovely, yeah, there you go. Beautiful. What a gorgeous little bird. Go on. Run, lovely. That's so nice. So this is where you've really got to have that fast shutter speed to keep up with them. It's super fast little birds and blowing in the wind. If I want to capture all the detail here, I've got to keep up with that. Pushing my ISO up a little bit because we're losing the light. Oh no, it's all come back out again. There we go. And I'm up about 3000 and that's perfect for this kind of shoot. Just trying to keep my focus point locked on their head as they're running about. It's quite hard because they're moving all the time and, uh, and then just firing off little groups of shots. It's always best to work in little groups of images. Don't just take one or two, little groups of five or six. It's why having a high frames per second camera can be really helpful just for getting that little tiny moment that can make a photograph from a very simple portrait into something a little bit nicer. So as a wildlife photographer, you can imagine, I spend a lot of time on my front like this, just slowly crawling towards the oyster catchers. Oh, not that far ahead of me now. Um, and I just wanna make a few images from a little bit distant before I get a bit closer. Now, one of the things I like to do is to make compositions where I put a bird in front of another group of birds. Just adds a bit of interest to the background and makes it look a bit more natural. You know, a lot of the time, if we concentrate on only getting a single subject in the shot, it can get a bit boring after a while. So it's nice to mix it up a bit. You know, sometimes you'll find uh, a small group of birds and you're looking for those compositions of, you know, one off to one side with two on another side or one in front with some slightly out of focus in the background or even shooting through a group in the foreground and birds in the background it just really mixes it up a bit you know when you're on a location like this i'm always trying to get as close as possible to the ground as well this means that i can get a nice bit of foreground a little bit of uh, out of focus sand it just really gives the context the image if i'm a bit higher like this shooting straight onto my subject. I've got nothing in the way uh, to add that depth to the image. So it's so much nicer, if at all possible, to be as low as possible. Now, of course, I usually use the viewfinder, but if you are struggling, you can, of course, use the flip screen. It is quite nice as well. Really big benefit of those modern mirrorless cameras. But right, let's keep going. So the birds are just walking towards me at the moment. I'm just pushing my autofocus point out to the side and then locking them on and tracking them. Trying to pick the one bird that's gonna walk to the corner of my composition. That's quite nice. 
There's a couple of sandlings mixed in with the oyster catchers. Um, and just picking out different species of birds within others can of course also make some interesting shots. Oh, that's rather nice. Yeah. Just gonna not move too much for the oyster catchers because from experience, they are one of the birds that spook the easiest. And if you spook one group of birds, everything will go. And all the hard work you put in, crawling across the beach, getting soaking wet to get into your perfect spot, you completely just not worth it. So it's always best be patient, take your time, and let them slowly work their way to you. If you're in a good position, everything like that. This one's rather nice. Right, so I've just caught up with a couple of sandling that are kind of making their way towards me across the sand now. Got down early so I could be in position and now I'm just going to wait for them to come towards me. The light is pretty cracking, it's just poking out of the clouds. Fingers crossed this should make some really nice clean portraits. I'm working down at f4.5, um, basically to give me a really shallow depth of field so I can blur out the background and get a really nice um, simple composition as the birds are moving around in my frame. Oh that is gorgeous, really gorgeous. The light is lovely. One thing you've got to be careful with especially white birds in bright conditions is not to blow their highlights. So just underexposing maybe like a third and stuff like that is great to just make sure that you don't clip any highlights and that you make sure you reserve all the detail in your files. Oh, they're coming so lovely and close. Oh, absolutely stunning little birds. So often what I'm trying to do is choose a multitude of compositions. I'll shoot a couple first with the birds on the right hand side looking to the left of the frame and then switch it round so they're on the left of the frame looking to the right. This gives me kind of, you know, different options for when I'm either, you know, selling to clients as a professional or just to see which image looks best. It's nice to work round in the four, you know, using the rule of thirds to create your compositions and just kind of make some really clean and simple uh, bird portraits. Right, well it's been a cracking morning on the beach. Actually super stoked with some of the images that I got as I was working on the tide line. You know, getting down low, crawling along, had the oyster catchers, the sandling, some really nice stuff. The light came out as well that was super cool, uh, meaning I could really nail off a few shots. Um, it's lovely when you have a morning's bird photography like that. But now as the light's kind of getting up a bit, I'm going to grab my bag and head back towards the car and uh, give you a few final tips for your winter wildlife photography whilst we're on the way. Right, well it's been a great morning out doing some bird photography here on the coast and it brings us to the end of this Wex Photo Videos wildlife photography course. Hope you've enjoyed it and picked up some really useful tips. Just before I go, I wanted to give you a few final points to be thinking about when you're out doing your own wildlife photography. You know, to be prepared. Make sure you've got the gear you need, have everything out, good clothing, all of that to get you sorted when you're on the field. Be patient. Spend a lot of time waiting for your subjects. It's not all going to happen in a single day. And of course, finally, be respectful. Look after the wildlife and the places that you're visiting. Keep it in a good stead so that it's going to be there for many generations to come. And of course, get out there and enjoy your wildlife photography.